Welcome to the International Media Association for Peace monthly webinar. I'm Pierre Beauregard, the coordinator for IMAP Canada. IMAP represents a global network of journalists who support socially responsible and moral media and are committed to work together for the achievement of a world of peace based on the principles of interdependence, mutual prosperity, and universally shared values. Today, we'll be discussing the topic human trafficking, internet porn, and our children. Human trafficking is the fastest growing organized crime activity in the United States, making almost $32 billion a year for traffickers while destroying the lives of thousands of innocent children. According to, Fed, to the federal human trafficking report, more than 50% of criminal human trafficking cases in the U.S. involved only children. These children are often still living at home with their parents and who are they, and they are unaware of the situation. How is that possible? Most of these young, most of these young people are recruited through social media apps and websites. Traffickers and pedophiles also use social media platforms like TikTok to distribute child sexual abuse material, also called child pornography, one of the most lucrative markets for sex traffickers. Our moderator today is Peggy Ujiri. Peggy lives in the Denver area with her husband, Kenji. They have three grown children. She serves as executive director for UPF Colorado and Rocky Mountain coordinator for IMAP. Peggy has over 40 years of experience in organizing interfaith and intercultural events and promoting faith-based values in the U.S. and internationally. Peggy, you have the floor. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you for that introduction. And um, I want to thank everyone for coming today. I, uh, I think this we have a very important topic. And we're being joined today by three heroes in this field. And so um, I think we have a lot to learn and uh, a lot to digest and think about through their presentations. So I'm going to start off by introducing Andrew Love. Andrew uh, is the executive director of High Noon International, which is an organization that provides education on the effects of pornography and provides recovery support to individuals through small groups, courses, and accountability. It was founded in 2016 to support individuals worldwide in overcoming pornography addictions and embracing sexual integrity. I knew now also provides resources to help parents talk to their children about sexuality, assist couples in developing healthy, intimate relationships, and facilitates healings for those who have experienced past trauma. Originally from Canada, Andrew has led an exciting life as a stand-up comedian, a pastor, and the leader of an educational nonprofit. He and his wife, Uyanga, and their three sons are currently spending time in Mongolia, his wife's homeland. They've opted for an international lifestyle, exposing their sons to many different cultures. With a home base in Denver, Colorado, they have spent significant time in Bali, Costa Rica, and Mongolia. Mr. Love's dedication to High Noon International's global mission is an expression of his desire to live a life dedicated to others and to create an enduring legacy of empowerment and community. Andrew, would you like to share your presentation? Indeed, I would. Thank you for that meaty introduction. And I would like to quote you on that hero business. Get me some points with my wife. Um, I'll say that it wasn't me, it was somebody else. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Uh, so much for attending these these type of events. Um, sharing is so, so important. And that's really the business that I've been involved in heavily for the past number of years, which is bringing difficult topics to the surface so we can talk about it, deal with it, and heal them. Um, they do no good hiding under the surface. In fact, they act like a societal cancer so long as they live there. And we must bring them to the light and we must fight for that to happen. So your participation in this is uh, monumental. And I hope that you can also take this information because I know the other speakers and I'm a huge fan of both. 
and not just of their speaking, but the foundation upon which they speak, uh, all their hard work. And if you can take this information and continue the conversation, it will do everybody a lot of good. So I'm going to be talking more about pornography. My little head here is just going to be floating around and, and this can go up an infinite number of different ways, this, this kind of conversation. And so I wanted to more, I used to give a lot of technical um, jargon and stats and science and that kind of stuff. And that is interesting and important, but you can find that online. I would, I would rather that you, if, if I could give you anything, the heart uh, as much as possible of what's going on with the people that I'm dealing with every single day. Okay. And typically what we're, our goal is with any given person or any given couple or any given family is to help, um, help them get to a place of liberation where they understand what, what they're a part of, why they're a part of it in terms of pornography, in terms of like, you know, the sinister side of our lives and then how to be liberated from it. And it is a process. Um, so I wanted to go over that at a, at a bit of a high level. So this quote and this this mentality, this worldview, I think is extremely helpful. And that is, so war and peace start in the human heart, whether that heart is open or whether that heart closes has global implications. And we're seeing that the only reason why things like human trafficking can be justified culturally or politically or on any level is because it's somehow okay in the hearts of humans. And that's where all war starts. But that's also where all of peace has the potential of starting in our hearts. And so every single day we're trying to help, uh, you know, at high noon, we're trying to help people find that peace in their heart so that they stop trying to escape because that's ultimately what porn is. It's a form of escape from pain within, resolve the pain within, stop the demand, stop the attraction. You know, that's where it all starts. So Back in the day, I was actually a huge fanboy of Don, one of our speakers today, because I went to an event. It was a summit in North Carolina back in 2015, something like that. And she was a big speaker, and I just felt like she was so cool, and, and she had so much power when she spoke and spoke with such authority. And at that same event, I heard this quote, and it hasn't left my psyche ever since, and that is, the opposite of addiction is connection. And this is really important because when you're dealing with something like pornography, there are many people that justify it. There are many people that are trying to normalize it, for sure. That's a part of our culture. Um, but there's also a huge swath of people who are involved in something that they don't want to be involved in. Like so many addictions, they would like to quit, but they don't know how. And they keep on, regardless of their effort, and they are making effort so many times, they wind up back in this dark place that they promise themselves and even sometimes the people in their lives that they'd never end up back in. And so this, uh, the, the question, like this, this statement creates a question in my heart, which is what is, what is true connection? Because it's easy to see a slogan like this and feel that it has some deep fundamental truths, but what does that mean connection? Okay. And I wanted to unpack that a little bit. Um, this is something that I've seen time and again, and that is the cycle of self-destruction. And that is when um, somebody has a, a deep, dark emotion, a very strong emotion, such as shame, guilt, uh, I don't know, anger, frustration. You could you could kind of swap that out at the top um, for a, a kind of a dark emotion. And they don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to deal with the overwhelming sense of being a failure or disappointing themselves or whatever. They, they failed at school. They failed at work. Something in their life really isn't working. They don't know how to deal with these emotions. So they want to escape them. And that is becoming an increasing common phenomenon, not just with porn, but, you know, just it's so easy to escape our lives far easier than ever before. In the past, if you wanted to escape, you had to mount a horse and ride to a village far away because you just lived in a little township or something like that. But now you just whip out your phone anytime, anywhere, and you cease to exist in this reality. Now you're, you know, neck deep in a, in a completely different reality. And so 
the but the the problem is obviously that any form of escaping your problems only creates more problems and it actually creates more of a longing to escape and it creates this reciprocity of wanting to escape more and then having to escape more because you don't know how to deal with these mounting problems and it creates this situation where people are out of control and again i'm 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 saying this not to justify the behavior but to help you understand because i guarantee you, you know somebody who's addicted to porn um, and it's hard to understand why, because so many times they're really, really good people. They're leaders in your community. They're your friends and your family. And and you could, uh, I know a lot of people that, that hold the view are like, well, just stop. And it's like, well, there's more to it. This is really an emotional issue. It's a spiritual, emotional issue. Uh, I'm just waiting for my slides. There we go. And so one thing that I'd really like to point out are these two opposites. When you have people who have some sort of ideals, they could be religious, they could just be righteous people, good people, and they would like to live a certain way. And in the beginning, those ideals, those, those virtues, those values that they have bring them so much hope because they have a healthy relationship with them. But when their actions start to live in opposition to their ideals, it starts to create pain in themselves. And this is actually a huge problem because at a certain point, when you live far enough away from your ideals for long enough, your ideals actually start to bring you pain rather than hope. So the idea of having a healthy marriage could just be a painful thing rather than a, a, a vision that inspires you, right? And so we often at, at High Noon are introduced to people in their journey at this point when they are living at this, at this precipice of having to give up one thing or the other. Because at a certain point you do, you have to either give up your ideals on one side or you have to give up your pain. And those who want to give up their pain, seek help. They they want they, they want to change in some way. Um, and that's where we come in. Um, and I wanted to, to also illustrate this point that um, the idea of connection, it's actually intimacy. The feeling of intimacy doesn't necessarily Necessarily means sexuality. That's a part of intimacy, but intimacy is just a sense of closeness. That my heart feels close to myself. That my heart feels close to another person. This is something that's fundamentally lacking in our disjointed society, where isolation is running abound. We have lost the basic skill sets of learning how to reach out, and it's so much easier to try to find answers on Google or online. But those actually only create more of a longing for connection, right? And so the di distance between hearts is where hell exists. And that doesn't necessarily mean a religious term. It just means hell on earth. It, it means war. It means human trafficking. This is substantial hell. And you can see it because everybody loses in this environment. And the only reason that anybody could justify hurting another person is because they're disconnected from that person. But only a person who's disconnected from themselves could be disconnected from another. And so this is really a journey back. I despise porn. And, you know, I don't, I don't think it has any biological necessities. I don't believe it, it's serving us in any way other than it's throwing something into our face that has been around for eons. But now it's unavoidable, which is we can either completely all bury our heads in the sands collectively and just, you know, I don't know, suffer collectively, or we can finally see the opportunity to start to actually care about each other and things like human trafficking, which Patrick is going to eloquently bring to the surface in his talk is something that needs to be nipped in the bud, but it doesn't, policies are a massive part of it. You know, there's so many facets to it, but it always starts in the human heart. The desire to resolve this starts when we realize that we, when we start to feel the pain of, of the victims themselves, when we start to humanize this situation and, and not just see it as statistics, right? Um, so this is what we've been also working to help people to establish, which is the psych cycle of sexual integrity. And that's when people's ideals, their best self and their sexuality are inextricably linked it's when they are one and that's when a person's life is working it's just working it's, that's how you create momentum in your life and that's what we've been helping people to establish in their life 
Because for so many people, they might have a lot of their life in order, but sex is this strange, dark aspect that they don't quite understand because it's rife with emotion and trauma and all this stuff. And to, to unpack it, to understand it, to heal it allows you then to live in line that you're constantly, you have integrity because the person that you'd like to be is the person that you are all the time, not just most of the time, but all of the time. And that is liberation itself, going back to that original title slide. So I believe I just, I, I want to cover the, we have certain non-negotiable ingredients to how somebody goes from being addicted, disjointed, disconnected to being liberated. Okay. And these are the, these are not just words. I know sometimes organizations have slogans and they, we believe in this, but this is like, this is what we live and breathe and die for in high noon in our own lives to represent them and substantiate them in our own lives, but also to help people establish in their own lives. And that is honesty, accountability, grace, integrity, and courage. And I, I would encourage you to write those down and you can go to our website, highnoon.org. And there's, we have tons of podcasts and unpacking this because these are things that I think a lot of people would say, yeah, I'm basically doing this. But when you look, it's like, these are actually muscle groups. That's the last thing I'm going to say is these are muscle groups that maybe you're weaker in some than others, but the, if you really become strong in the areas of totally being honest all the time, even when it's very inconvenient and painful, accountable to other people for who you are about all the important stuff in your life, when you're allowed to receive grace, forgiveness, and that helps you to give grace to others. When you create integrity, so like a clear plan and you live by that plan, it all takes courage. When you're living like that, then you start to experience liberation at higher and higher levels. There's so much more to say, but I have no more time. And it was a pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you very much. And I've, I've written those down and I'm going to go to your website and figure out what what the uh, the elements of those are. So thank you very much. And we will thank have a, a little time at the end for some questions and, and discussion. Um, so I, I'd like to introduce Patrick Erlandson. Uh, Patrick is a native of California, and he and his wife, Makiko, have two adult daughters. So he's not just talking about what other people should do, but he has experience himself being a parent. So in 2010, while working with the United Nations High Commission on Refugees in Los Angeles, he learned about human trafficking in organs from some field agents that were working in Africa and decided to get involved. So in 2012, he took on a leadership role in the, in the Long Beach Human Trafficking Task Force. Patrick organized two youth exploitation safety symposiums for the city of Long Beach and consequently founded father.com, father.com, which has held four conferences. And the most recent one was in Vienna, Austria, under the auspices of the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime. Father Khan inspires, informs, and equips men to be the very best they can for themselves, their families, and their communities. The vision of Father Khan is to see an end to human exploitation and provide family and community well-being through father presence and responsible engagement. In 2018, he also founded See It and It Film and Arts Festival, which he then expanded internationally by enabling online participation. And every month, Patrick leads an anti-human trafficking rally in Long Beach under the banner, Men Standing Against Trafficking. So let's welcome Patrick Erlandson. Um, thank you so much, Peggy. And it, it is such an honor and humbling to be sandwiched between the likes of Andrew Love and Don Hawkins, both of whom I've known over the, the decade that I've been working on the prevention of human trafficking, which is the area that I, I kind of pursued. Um, of all the different you know, areas that need to be addressed um, with regard to human trafficking, uh, my heart really fell to, to prevention. Um, every time I heard of a, of a survivor who didn't survive, of a victim who ended up losing her life um, and, and realizing the consequences of this um, of this, of just how horrid human trafficking is in the lives of especially children, but anyone who's vulnerable. Um, 
I just wanted to stop one more person, um, anyone from going down that path or being sucked in or drawn down that path. Um, so I, I chose this quote. I recently listened to this interview with uh, Jack Reynolds, who's was convicted and spent, I believe, 12 years in prison for, for molesting and abusing children. Uh, and this really kind of highlighted one of the reasons why I, I ended up narrowing my focus on fathers, uh, because fathers are in a unique position um, of intersecting with human trafficking. And so I wanted to, I wanted to address fathers specifically. Um, let's see if I'm going to have control of the slides. There we go. Um, so one thing that always comes up is why the name FatherCon? Um, so when we first when we first called it FatherCon, we had people calling and saying, well, I've been in prison, so I guess this is for me. Um, other people were thinking that they would come to the conference and dress up as various fathers from TV shows and animation characters. Um, but actually, I chose the name FatherCon because I, I was really disturbed by the the number of men, of good men, um, we, we have a spectrum, you know, within this, you know, the, the deviance of, of human beings and the corruption of the human heart. And there's those that are just completely psychotic and, you know, are, have no have no compassion for others and are willing to hurt um, and enjoy it. And then they're, then all the way up to the saints. And in, in, the, in the middle, what I find is that it's, you know, more and more we're being targeted as men, we're being targeted as human beings. And we're being lied to about what's really going to make us happy in our lives. And there's a lot of confusion. And so it, I wanted to address the con, the, the lies that we fall for. And then also on an interpersonal relation, on, on an interpersonal level, the conversations we need to have with our spouse. We need to, to really grow our capacity to understand and interact with each other through conversations with our spouse, with our children. Um, and then the conference was a coming together. We, we don't live in isolation. Our families influence and impact the community around us. And so that was really centered around um, this conference and coming together and, and learning about the dangers, learning about things that we didn't know already, things that could help us get a, a, getting introduced to services and, and, and support and resources that can help us as individuals and families. Um, but also to celebrate fatherhood. We, we just do not celebrate enough the the role the the powerfully impactful role that fathers occupy in the lives of their children and their communities um, this is not a men's organization that's one thing i have to make really clear it's father centered and so that means there's a spouse there's a there's women involved there's a mother involved and there's children involved so a lot of our education really is inclusive of of women understanding the importance of fathers as well because we have a lot of harm being done when when a person is hurt and then they they end up damaging the children further by taking out their pain on on their, a husband or on the father of their children, um, and we really have to we really have to address that as well. Um, let's see. So next, I don't know how familiar people are. We can go to the next slide. Somehow it's not working for me to change it. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to touch on human trafficking for those who are not perfectly familiar with it. I chose three definitions from the United Nations, from Homeland Security, and from the Polaris Project. I really like the simplicity of the Polaris Project. Human trafficking is the business of stealing freedom for profit. Um, and I think that that's very, very important, really sums it up fairly well. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily require movement of people. Um, it, it generally, they use the terms force, fraud, and coercion. Um, none of those are required to be human trafficking when the person is under 18. Okay, next. Um, so I wanted to just introduce the, the process. Of course, people who saw the movie, um, The Sound of Freedom, you know, there was there were some complaints about that movie because it's centered in Colombia. And it was, it, for some people, it reinforced the idea that human trafficking is an over there problem and it's a, you know, those people problem. Um, there is no one pattern. There is no one type of human trafficking. There's there's no one method that is that is used. It, it is a nuanced and and varied human enterprise, and it affects people very very deeply in a lot of different ways. But I wanted to highlight these. So there's a targeting when you're you're identifying a vulnerable person that you can exploit. A lot vulnerability is often loneliness, being afraid, angry, misunderstood, or sad. 
Um, the grooming process is where you're changing the person's feelings and thinking and beliefs. Um, and a lot of those methods are befriending someone, establishing a common identity. We're in this together. It's you and me, babe. It's us against the world. Um, we share a common interest. We both want to get rich. We both want to create something through our relationship. And a lot of times with children, there's like shared secrets. You know, don't tell your parents. So you have this kind of camaraderie that, that ends up creating a divide between that child and their parents or, or other people and, and, and bonds them to the, the person who's grooming them. Um, the recruitment is when it actually turns into physical action. So you're actually, you're meeting. If, if the process of being targeted and groomed was online, which the majority of cases are today, um, then the recruitment would be where they actually meet and an exploitation starts to happen. There's a, a, the clear roles of who's in, who's in charge and who's submitting. And then there's the process of, of maintaining that relationship, which involves everything from violence to kindness and taking a girl out to get her nails done um, in order to keep her loyalty. Um, the one thing that's really just, just so heartbreaking as a parent is that a trafficker weaponizes the vulnerabilities of a child. And every single child, every single person has um, vulnerabilities. We all have kinks in our armor. We all have times when our masks fall off and we are exposed. And it's those moments when, when the wrong person meets you that, that we can be affected. And I think this, this, you know, this idea of the grooming, the recruiting and targeting that's also happening to men. And this is the thing that I found in working on the prevention of trafficking. It was so easy to identify, so easy to feel your heart break for a person who's being victimized by someone who's intentionally victimizing them. But I felt what we were overlooking was men are being constantly groomed to think a certain way and feel a certain way about what they're entitled to and what their life should provide them. And, and that is, is sucking them into where they're, they're in a moment of weakness, you can be moved to a, to a, a place as Andrew so um, adeptly pointed out where an addiction to pornography and addiction to kind of sex can occur. Um, so then looking at, looking at fathers and why I chose fathers, they intersect with human trafficking in several ways. One is their personal behavior. If you look at pornography, if you're out buying sex, you're interacting with the commercial sex industry and the more people that, that are in, you know, customers of that industry, the more it expands and grows. One thing that I found that men don't really realize in, in going through Pornhub's data, which they so proudly uh, present every year, um, was that every click, every time you click on something, that's being registered and it's and it's then being commodified. It's it's then being commercialized and, and expanded. So the more time that people are looking at, at two women together or a transgender or whatever the 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 type of content, they're going to make more of it. There's going to be more market for more of it. And that's why you've seen an explosion in incest based porn. Um, thousands of times an increase. I think it's 4000 times I read an increase in the production of incest based porn, which when you consider an eight year old being exposed to, you know, a sex with your sister, that can explain some other things that are happening that I'll touch on later. Um, also, fathers can facilitate, they facilitate or enable um, exploitation by nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Can we go back to the slide again? I'm sorry. Um, but there's kind of an enabling and facilitating. You, you know, not actively participating, but you're allowing it or, or in some way nominally encouraging it. Um, and then critically is the impact on sons and the impact on daughters. And this is where I saw if we could, if we could get fathers aware of this and, and to, to gain dominance over their behavior, and realize how important they are to their sons and their daughters, that we cut off both the supply and the demand. We don't have sons that are out paying for 12 year olds. Um, we don't have daughters that are, that are believing someone they meet on Instagram and running off with them after a week, um, which is happening. Um, now you can go to the next slide. Um, so fathers occupies very important positions. The things that really stood out for me are a child develops a sense that they're worthy to be loved from their relationship with their father um, more than the mother. The mother, they've already bonded even before they, they come out into this glorious world that we've been given. Um, they've already bonded with the mother. And, um, and yet the father, if the father gets down on his hands and knees and plays with a child, it's communicating, you know, you're worth my time. So when a father invests in his children, it's communicating something on a very deep level to that child about their worthiness. 
Fathers also really, they demonstrate integrity by being trustworthy as they dominate themselves, as they control themselves, they, they communicate that to their children and a sense of responsibility and also empathy, which I'll talk, touch on in a minute. Um, let's go to the next slide. And, ch and children, obviously we hear this constantly and anybody who's a parent knows children learn through imitation. Um, this is a, an extremely important because they learn not just during infancy, but through their entire lives. They're modeling, they're learning how to do things um, through watching, observing, and imitating. Um, I love this second part where children will copy everything that they see an adult demonstrate to them, even if there are clear or uh, there aren't clear or obvious reasons why those actions would be relevant, so why they're irrelevant. So even if something does, completely doesn't make sense, the child will imitate it thinking that there must be a reason for this because my, my parent is doing it. Um, when I demonstrate the action, it's purposeful. So the mind of a child, perhaps there's a reason why I'm doing this. They'll assume that there's a, that there's a reason for it and they'll do it. So when the son finds his father, you know, looking at, a, at pornography, the, the logical assumption of that child is that there's something meaningful about this. There's something that then he would attribute value to it because his father is doing it. Um, next. Um, Man's Search for Meaning, awesome, awesome book and idea. Um, not just men are searching for meaning, but um, children are constantly looking for the meaning of things. And I love this quote from Dr. Meg Meeker, and I highly recommend her, her books um, on fathers, on children. She's a uh, pediatrician. Uh, but nothing you say or do is neutral. Your absence is not neutral. Not engaging is not neutral either. We are constantly communicating and, and transmitting meaning to our children. Um, empathy, I found this incredibly fascinating. This study by Kessner, Franz, and Weinberger, it was a 26-year-long longitudinal study, and what they found was that fathers who spent time with their children impacted the development of empathy in children more than anything else um, by far. Um, and it's how, ch how parents play with their children. They communicate empathy. It, uh, fathers will allow someone to get hurt. We expand. We, we allow some things to go to the edges where they're going to be hurt. Mothers tend to be very protective and, and create a buffer around children. Um, but actually, in the process of someone getting hurt, children a lot of times will learn, you know, boundaries. They learn that I can only go this far. If I, if I keep pushing my sister down and she's crying, my dad's going to stop playing with me, and I don't want that to happen. Um, so there's, all, there's this really deep transmission of empathy to children by the father and how he plays and interacts with kids. Um, there's another great book, The Case Against the Sexual Revolution by Louise Perry. And she makes a comment in the book. She says, oh, it's, it's only good for men. The, the sexual revolution was only good for men, but it's bad for women and children. My argument would be, no, it's not. It's really bad for men to be told that their, their most animalistic and irresponsible behavior is okay. This is not a good thing. This is not something that's helpful for us. We have skyrocketing suicide rates of men who are looking back on their life at the age of 50 and going, what the hell did I live for? I've got my kids hate me. I'm divorced. You know, all I have is some money, but what's what good is that? And, and so we're creating um, very unhappy and very in so many men that have a, no sense of meaning or purpose to their lives. Some of the things that she touches on are the birth control pill, which was the first time we created a medicine that causes the body not to work properly. Um, and, and you started to see the separation of sex from the consequence of having a child. No fault divorce. Again, the, all of these things contributed to our current situation, which is now a serious decline in marriage and also in children being raised by married parents, which has declined from 8% to 50% since 1968. And then porn going online, it's 24 seven access. Um, so, so now with pornography, you're removing intimacy. You're removing actually caring about another human being from the process of having sexual pleasure. Um, and then the Me Too movement, which began a shift to consent. We no longer look at what's really good and bad, what's right or wrong. Moralistically, we, we say, well, if, it's, if someone consents, then it must be okay. Um, there's very dangerous consequences to that um, as we go forward. Um, trauma, we hear so much about trauma, and it's such an important thing to understand. I tend to look at it as like the, the original trauma is something we're not designed for a world where parents abuse their children. Our brains are just not equipped to handle that. And so we experience trauma when we're trying to make sense out of a world that doesn't make sense. It's just not what we're designed for. 
And all of us have been exposed to a number of experiences and, and influences that were not normal. I think back on the exposure to porn. When I first found you know, Playboy magazines when I was a kid, it, it's planted something in my mind that, that affected the trajectory of my life. And it's like, what if we never got exposed to pornography? What if we never saw the kind of violence that, that is common now for children to grow up with? Um, quickly on, I'm already over time. I'm so sorry. Go, go, go. Next. <laughs> um, so we have too many fathers. We have one out of six boys are sexually abused. Um, they're not healing. They're carrying that into their, their marriages and into their relationships. Um, next. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, and then pornography and predators. Um, this is one of the things Heidi Olson is a forensic nurse who talks about the, um, the, the, the number of sexual abuse cases that she's dealing with are, are perpetrated. The largest number is by 11 to 15 year olds. Um, mm -hmm. and this is really growing and it's because of pornography. Next, um, sextortion. I can't really touch on this, but this is huge. This is affecting a lot of boys. Boys are being targeted. A lot of times they're being targeted for money. You know, they, they get them get a boy to send a naked pictures of himself and then threaten to expose it to others and then and then get money from him. Girls, it's often for an increase in escalating of, of sexual behavior, either to watch or then to create pornography that they can distribute to others. Next. Um, this is one of the things the, the thing that I find so disturbing is just our, our emphasis on entitlement through advertising, through politics, through our culture. We're constantly telling people that they deserve this, they deserve that because they're born, because they breathe, they're, they should have all of these things. Um, that It's really, really derailing men from a sense of responsibility and, and derailing integrity, which is impacting our children and making them vulnerable. This, this advertisement there, you'd never guess what that's for. Um, it's actually a watch, a watch advertisement, um, which is just rather disturbing. Um, okay, next. What's happening with men today? We can't go into all of this, but suicide is rising. Suicide of children um, between 13 and 14 year old, years old has doubled since 2008. Um, there, there are six to seven million men between 25 and 54. They're not even looking for work anymore. Um, there's a decline in marriage, 60% um, decline since 1960, and we're facing a falling birth rate. The reason I say these things is because um, men are not having children, which means they're not developing the, the heart and capacity as a father, which changes who we are, which, which drives us to become responsible and, and in control of ourselves. Um, this is a terrible thing for us socially, globally, um, that we are not having children uh, at a rate that we need to be. Next. I'm sorry, I'm going to skip through all of these. Happiness and sex, we really need to kind of stop saying happiness and sex is something that we can create. We, that's a byproduct of how we live. Next. Um, so Father Khan, our, our goal is to inform and inspire fathers, inspire families, and to equip them for the 21st century. Um, keep going. We've had a number of, we've had four conferences. We do trainings and workshops really to inform people on, on areas that they really need to understand. Next. Um, We've done film, um, a lot of film and panel discussions. Dr. Stephanie Powell, who works with Don, has been just a, a jewel and priceless in her contributions to things that we've done as FatherCon. And next, um, when, when I presented at the UN um, on May 24th, I spoke about the necessity. If we want to prevent crime, if we want to prevent a lot of these things that are happening, boys dropping out of school, we really need to start investing in strengthening and, and keeping fathers engaged and in, in, in the home instead of dealing with the consequences. Um, and I was immediately approached by delegates from about the 400 countries that were there who said, no one talks about fathers here, which I found um, sad. Okay, that's it. That's me. Thank you. I'm so sorry I went over time. Thank you very much, Patrick. That was really fascinating. I love how you not only look at how fathers care for their children, but how they can become more responsible in their own behavior and influence their children in a way without saying a word. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And I would like to introduce our final speaker, Don Hawkins. Uh, Don Hawkins serves as the CEO at the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, NICOSI, with a deep commitment to not bipartisan public policy 
Dawn has sparked significant change in federal and state legislation, as well as pivotal shifts in multi-million dollar corporate policies. In collaboration with Patrick Truman, Dawn envisioned and established the Law Center to legally confront those who profit from sexual exploitation. Her leadership has been instrumental in refocusing efforts to address the demand for commercial sex, significantly weaken the mainstream pornography industry, and advocating for stronger accountability measures for technology platforms to ensure child safety. So Nicosi, they approach it from every different angle, you know, helping uh, kids and parents and families, but also going after the policy changes and the corporate changes that need to happen in order to make that pornography not so easily accessible to young people. So help, please join me in welcoming Dawn Hawkins. Hello, everyone. I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty, so you might have a little garbled things, but I'm grateful to be with Patrick and Andrew. Really, we all have the same thing in my in in common, and that's we're trying to prevent the issue of sexual abuse and exploitation. One thing I think is so critical for people to understand is the role that um, the internet and these internet platforms and social media companies is playing are playing as part of this problem. What we've seen is, you know, in countless cases of children who have been exposed to hardcore pornography on social media platforms or who have been exposed to predators with nefarious intent. And it's only because these platforms have enabled it. They have not prioritized child safety in the least. They've allowed harmful predators to send private direct messages to children. They've allowed dangerous hashtags to go viral full of harmful content that kids are looking up. And so it's no wonder that our youth now are suffering from a pandemic of sexual abuse and exploitation. They're being told that things like sexting and sending um, and, and engaging in explicit behavior online is normal and even expected because of the messages that they're getting on these platforms. I'll just tell a little story. So we have at the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, we're involved in policy, corporate advocacy, and civil litigation. We found that these three together are having quite a big impact in changing these big companies to prioritize child safety and human dignity as a whole. But one example is a client of ours, I'll call her CU. Um, she was a young girl, age 10, when she was playing a, an immensely popular game for our young people. My nine-year-old is begging me every day to play this game. There are 12.8 million kids under age eight on Roblox every single day. They built this game for kids. Yet on this game, they allow adults to privately message and communicate, even talk with the children on the platform. And because of that, predators are just rampant. Well, with CU, her mother, she begged her mom to have access to Roblox. Her mother had filters in place in the house, you know, had extremely regulated um, online usage for her screen time. And she only let her play mostly when she was doing chores, when the mom was doing chores. So she gave her an iPad and said, you can play while I'm folding laundry. So this little girl, 10 years old, started playing Roblox next to her mom in the same room. But a predator was also able to start typing and messaging with CU. And he got her attention. He continued to groom her. He convinced her to send nude images of herself, 10 years old. This went on for a couple of years. This little girl became so sad, so withdrawn, so isolated, and her, her parents had no idea what was going on. This man got her private address. He sent her a burner phone so she could have be talking and communicating with him without her parents knowing. He went on to exploit her in some of the worst, worst ways. Her abuse went over to not just on Roblox, but over to Snapchat and Discord. These are massively popular platforms used by children. And these platforms know that this kind of abuse is rampant, yet they haven't fixed these flaws. Our law center is now has now joined a lawsuit where we're suing these big companies because it's not okay <laughs> what they're doing. And as long as they're not prioritizing our child's safety, there's gonna we're gonna have to talk about these issues. 
the connection between sex trafficking, pornography, and child sexual abuse. It's, it's virtually merged online. Another example I'll share with another one of our plaintiffs, a young girl who was sex trafficked. She was raped again and again. Her abuse was filmed and uploaded to Pornhub and other big mainstream pornography websites. It was uploaded because these websites don't check to verify that there's consent or that those depicted are even adults because anybody can upload anything. And and this is the way that their business model is set up. They're looking to exploit and make as much money as they can. They don't care who you are. They don't care that you're a child. And so our our goal at the National Center on Sexual Exploitation is to hold these huge institutions accountable that are enabling sexual abuse and exploitation. And I invite you to join with us. We have um, campaigns like the Dirty Dozen List, where we name 12 big companies every year who are pr- partnering with sexual abuse and exploitation. And we make it so easy for you to send messages to executives at these companies or to reach out to your legislators. Um, last, I'll just say, I'm telling, telling you so many hard and heavy things, but when we join together and we raise our voices, we're seeing massive change. Just earlier this year, Apple, Apple had a has has a big problem. It takes 31 steps to turn on the built-in parental controls in Apple. There's and you have to go to like four different places in the settings. It's so complicated. So after a bunch of parents and grandparents joined together with us, calling on Apple to change, they rolled out with just a software setting. If you have a child's device paired with a parent's device through family sharing, these safety settings automatically go on. We believe this is what has to happen across the board. We need a default to safety and we need these companies to design with child safety in mind. And so you can help us do that. Another big one is called Kick. Kick isn't as popular in the United States where I am, but it's hugely popular globally for children. It's a social media platform. And it's rife. It's the worst, worst, worst. It's rife with sexual predators who are constantly just targeting kids. And earlier this year, because of parents and grandparents joining with us on the Dirty Dozen list, we got Kick and Apple to change the rating of this horrible app from age four to age 17. So that if you have the parental controls turned on, only only adults can get access this is just common sense solution. So I call on you to help help join me by going after the big corporations that are profiting from and facilitating sexual abuse and exploitation. And Peggy, with that, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you so much, Don. That was that was pretty disturbing, but um, informative. <laughs> so, um, Samwa, can you bring up all of our panelists on the screen? And uh, I'm going to throw out a question that, uh, and I'm going to ask each of you to to kind of give a a short response. And uh, if you want to then, you know, direct uh, a question to one another, that would, you could also chime in on that. So the question is, what do you think is the most important step that parents can take to protect their children from these online porn sites. And the other part of that is, um, what is the most important step that someone listening to this webinar could take to protect not only their own children, but work to protect others, the children of others, in other words, to uh, address this on a national or international level? And I'll go back and start with Andrew. Okay. Um, well, I'm I'm in the business of interpersonal relationships. Kind of the one-to-one is something that's severely lacking. So the one thing that I, I would say is that all conversations about touchy topics, taboo topics are awkward in the beginning. And they're awkward until they stop being awkward because they're just normal. And so to normalize 
a topic like sexuality within the family is not only a good idea, I think it's a fundamental, fundamental need for our world that we live in. Just not the bad stuff, like be aware of the bad stuff too, but also the stronger, this touches more on kind of Patrick's, what he was talking about, but the stronger uh, a child has awareness of their value, the less likely they'll settle for less, right? It's It's in the absence of a conversation that, they'll find their value in how they, how many likes they get on TikTok and all this. So my whole thing is just a lot of conversations often, not one conversation. A lot of people think like, Oh, I had the talk. No, so many talks I have. I, uh, I was muted during this, but my sons were listening to Patrick and Don's presentations because this kind of content is commonplace in our house. It's just normal. So, I think question what's normal and then figure out, do you like that normal? And what would you like to become normal and practice that? And uh, conversations about sexuality, I think, are, are extremely helpful if done right. And it takes practice. I'll shut up now. Thank you. How about Patrick? Um, so I go, I, I mean, there's so many things. And, and Don is so inspiring, everything that they're doing, because they give you really clear action steps you can take. But I think for me, it's like we we don't prioritize being trustworthy for our kids. And it's our kids need to be able to come to us. When that child started having these conversations in Discord or, you know, with someone, you know, they should be able to to feel that they can go to their parents and say, look, this made me feel a little a little strange. You know, do you think this is OK? But I think we 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 need to make sure that our children know that they can approach us and talk to us about those things as well. And that we're not. The problem now is that children's lives are so associated with devices that their fear, if they tell you something that happened, you're going to take away their devices, which is tantamount to killing them, you know, in, in their minds. And so we have to be able to approach these issues, not from the standpoint, like, I'm going to, you know, as soon as they say, yeah, I looked at some porn, somebody showed me something, there was, you know, some naked women. And then we say, okay, that's it. You're not going to have your phone for a month. That that shuts them down, and it, and it, they need to know that we're that we are aware of these things and that we care about them, and but but we need to create an environment where kids feel that they can come and talk to us, and we don't really have that. When Don mentioned about you know how how easy it for us to put our phones down, how easy it for us to to establish our own trustworthiness with ourselves and for our children, this is critically important. I mean, I never forget, I had an experience, I was living in Japan, and my daughter, I don't know how old she was, maybe seven, and I, you know, I have two days off a month, I was so busy working there, and I was home, and I was watching a movie, and it was, you know, a, it was an action movie, I'm so sorry, occasionally I break down, but I was watching some action movie, and there was violence, and my daughter came in the room, and she said, no, I don't want to see that, I don't want to see that, and I told her, oh, well, then go in the other room, you know, instead of responding to her. I regret that every day of my life because I cannot remember anything about the movie, but I remember that I that my daughter was crying. And 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 that's just like seared into my heart. And and I think we really need to, to create a support system for, for parents so we prioritize being trustworthy for our kids. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. And Don Well I, I think Andrew and Patrick are Exactly right. And particularly the focus on relationships and creating a place in your with your children where they just trust you and they feel comfortable to come to you. I would add two other areas. Um, and I think you, you kind of hit on it, both of you, but frequent, open and open co communication always about these issues and just bringing it up regularly in a whole bunch of different ways and context, just like it's the normal Kind of talk in your in your home, Andrew. You you hit on that, and I mean, yeah, it's the same as my kids. Now my kids are teaching all the other kids about these issues, and I used to feel like kind of embarrassed, but now I'm like, no, those kids need the protective information as well. And then the the third is creating a place of security. I mean, we're not going to be able to completely protect our kids from seeing this, so preparing them with a healthy relationship and communication is key. But as much as we can creating places of security, not just giving them complete open access to the internet, using the tools that we do have will help tremendously. I think if I can add one thing, I heard this just recently, you know, where the parents feeling is, I don't want to not trust my kids. And, and that's just really, 
inappropriate in today's world. It's like it's not a question of you're not trusting your kids, but being aware that the environment is attacking them, that they're that they are targeted every day. And it's so it's it's communicating that to your kids. That it's not a question of I'm not trusting you, but but there are there are you know, you're being targeted and I gotta keep you safe because it's the best thing for you. And probably the other issue is that most parents grow grew up in a world where none of these things were available. So uh, we tend to be a little bit clueless about it. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's so important that people like you, uh, the three of you are coming out and exposing this and making parents aware of it. Um, so I, I want to let everyone on our webinar today know that you can find out more about these three terrific organizations. If you just Google High Noon International or father con or NCOSE, National Center for Sexual, not for Sexual Exploitation, but um, on Sexual Exploitation. And uh, especially um, uh, the Nicosi site has a lot of ways for you to get involved in contacting congressmen or writing, uh, signing petitions for social media uh, giants and things like that. And you can inform yourself a lot more about so many of these issues. And I really want to thank from the bottom of my heart, the three of you for getting on tonight and making this such an incredible webinar. And I, I hope that I wish you the best in all of your efforts. And I hope that uh, through this webinar, we can also gain more support for some of your efforts. So thank you. Thank you very much.